What's up everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Ariana and I do a lot of... <laughs> Daisy wants to say hi apparently. I do a lot of photography content here on my channel, specifically on film, Fuji, and Olympus. And if you are not new here, thank you for sticking around. I so, so appreciate it in this bit of a sporadic posting schedule that I've been having. And I still wanted to get up content anyways on a topic that I've actually been getting a ton of questions about and that is on how to get started in film photography. So let's go ahead and just get into it. So first is of course your camera. Now this can be a very daunting decision for someone who has only shot on their phone before because there's just so many different types of film cameras that you can get. So there are three main kind of options that I want to point out and for the sake of simplicity we're going to stick to 35 millimeter film which is basically the size of the film format. 35 millimeter is not the smallest, but it is kind of the smallest of the standard, more common film formats. And then you can get into medium and large format film. But if you're still in the beginning stages of photography, specifically film photography as well, or you just want a place to start, I always recommend 35 millimeter film. Now, there are different types of 35 millimeter film cameras that you can go for. So the first being your SLR or single lens reflex camera. This is kind of what you traditionally see when you think of that film camera look. And it's a very old school style. It is typically fully manual. And when I say fully manual, I mean not only manual focus on your lenses, but also you have to adjust each individual setting by yourself. And obviously that requires knowing how to adjust that, what to adjust, and what that looks like. So if that's something that you are willing to learn if you don't know already or something that you already know, single lens reflex cameras or SLR film cameras, I personally think are really fun to shoot with. They're also just beautiful to be able to carry around. And it's simple. There's less things that could break. Pretty much all you need is a camera that can open its shutter, close its shutter, and adjust the settings accordingly. Oh, if that's something, like I said, you're interested in learning, I do have a whole video on shooting manually and learning each of the settings. Typically, these cameras are also pretty inexpensive. They can range into the couple hundreds of dollars. However, I will say they're very, very, very good quality cameras and lenses when you get up into that range. My Olympus OM-10 was roughly $200, which I think is a pretty standard and average price for it. And it puts out beautiful, incredible images. The downside to SLR cameras are typically, well one, they're all manual. So I've talked about this in previous videos before, why I even got my Contax T2, which I'll get into in the next section, but they're fully manual, so you have to adjust all the settings yourself, and on top of that, you have to manually focus. This can be difficult if you are shooting in a space where it's lower light, so you need a higher shutter speed, or you can't zone focus. I'm getting into very, very technical photography terms here. But essentially, it could be very difficult to shoot manually in certain situations. And honestly, more often than not, if you're using a film camera just to capture different memories, moving people or dogs or whatever else you might be capturing on film that's moving, manual focus might be very frustrating for you. So next are your point and shoots. Point and shoots are probably where most people would start if you are getting into film photography and you do want to use it for shooting a bunch of moving objects and friends and family and pets and babies and whatever else you could possibly shoot that move around. So point and shoot cameras are basically what they sound like. You point them and then you shoot them, almost like an iPhone. And so essentially, a lot of point and shoot cameras are fully automatic. All you have to do is choose the film stock, which we will also move into in the next section. But essentially, once you have the film stock chosen and what film you're gonna use, everything is automatic, including focus. So it's much easier to shoot and it's much easier to shoot quickly. And Daisy is kicking me in the back here. Another benefit of many point and shoot cameras, not all, but of course something to look for, is that a lot of them do have built-in flash, 
which is another benefit of having them because it allows you more versatility to shoot in lower light situations. So point and shoot cameras can range anywhere from 30, 40, 50 dollars for a lower end one all the way up to a couple thousand dollars if you're gonna get a nicer high-end for example contacts t series and you definitely see the image quality difference in the two it just depends on what you want it for do you want the high quality images or do you just simply want to capture something on camera and last but not least are disposables disposables i personally don't use but are considered film so figured i would just point that out there the entire process of shooting purchasing and then developing and scanning your disposable film is going to be different because film pretty much stays in the camera the entire time so you never actually touch the film and you also don't get to choose or customize it yourself you simply buy the camera as whole if you're gonna be shooting a lot of film I always recommend just getting yourself a point-and-shoot camera they are essentially feel the same and at the same time you can reuse the camera as many times as you want and you can also choose different film stock to use in the camera lastly it is definitely more cost-effective to get a reusable 35 millimeter point-and-shoot than to continuously use disposable cameras but some people love disposables that's just what they enjoy shooting so of course that is an option so next is where to purchase your camera from so this is a whole world in itself but there are three primary places i recommend looking and that i personally look to when purchasing a new film camera or i guess technically new to me but the camera's not new anyways so the first place that's probably the most accessible is going to be ebay so, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of eBay before, but if you have not, it is a place online that people can resell their items. And a lot of storefronts have opened on eBay as well that sell new items. So when it comes to eBay, typically since there's so much more inventory available on eBay than other places that I'm gonna mention, one of the things that I would highly recommend looking out for are the words film tested. And that means not only does the camera look and sound like and seem like it's moving and the mechanics seem to work, but a roll of film has actually been shot through it and everything works as intended. So that to me is the highest standard in terms of buying a film camera. So the next place that I personally will go to is my local camera shop. Now your local camera shops can sometimes be a little bit more pricey, but you get benefits of it being your local camera shop and I can speak from my own personal experience only because every local camera shop is going to be different. Mine personally, I love having the people there to talk to about it, especially if I'm between two different film cameras that they have. A lot of times they've had experience shooting one or the other or in the same system or they've heard of things. It's nice to have a expert to talk to. Another thing that I really loved about my camera store was the fact that when one of the cameras they sold me did not work as intended they were super quick and take it back and i ended up purchasing another camera from them so it's a, just an overall really positive positive experience and if it's something that you want to learn as well oftentimes you know they'll be willing to teach you how to load the film and give you any tips on it, teach you how to shoot the camera. You can hold it, you can see it, you can feel it before you purchase it. So love my local camera shop. So next is Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist type of things. Essentially at this, you're buying it as is, you purchase it at your own risk. Some sellers will post like film tested, I've used it recently, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of times you're buying someone's like camera that they found in their grandma's garage when they were cleaning it out for her. But a lot of times also you can get really good deals because not a lot of people know the true value and worth of it so they end up selling it for super inexpensive and that is a great thing as well. And then lastly, I want to mention this, but I have not personally shopped in any of these things. There are a lot more small businesses that are popping up that sell film cameras. And I've seen a few of these. I've actually been sent a link to one. I forgot the name of it, but there are businesses now that are getting into the industry of film because film is coming back and it's becoming trendy again. And they're really capitalizing on that, which, you know, I can appreciate. Basically, one place to look is Etsy. There are a lot of Etsy sellers that resell film cameras now and those can be a great option as well because a lot of them that I have seen have also said film tested and whatnot so could 
should be pretty confident in purchasing those. And then there was one site that I was sent a link to where they packaged everything together to make like a film starter kit. Now it's definitely more expensive than if you were to just purchase each individual component yourself, but some people like that and some people can appreciate that and it makes it a lot easier to kind of get into film. Now I want to get into your film stocks. So obviously once you have your camera, you have to load it with film and how do you choose film? This is a whole topic in itself. So I'm going to go through kind of my go-to film stocks and then where I like to purchase them. So when it comes to film, you have a variety of different options. Within different brands, you have different film types and then within different film types or lines, you have your different sensitivities or ISO levels. So briefly, ISO levels or ASA levels as they used to be called are simply indicators of how sensitive the film stock is to light. When it comes to a higher number, that's a film stock that is more sensitive to light. So when you're getting into 800 and above, typically you would shoot those in lower light. Whereas if you're going lower in the numbers, you're dealing with 100s, 200s, even some 50s, that is usually reserved for very bright daylight situations where there's gonna be more light so the film stock does not need to be as sensitive to light in order to pick up your picture. Again, when you watch my video on how to shoot manual, I explain all this stuff more in depth. So when it comes to my go-tos, in terms of ISO levels, I typically go for 400. This is because sometimes I shoot film, a roll of film over multiple days in multiple different situations and scenarios. So 400 is a pretty versatile number to go for. I think it's also a great number for beginners to go for because it does well in sunlight, but it also does well in like golden hour situations. I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to say any darker than that, but it's a, it's a pretty wide range of versatility that you get with a film stock of 400. My go-to film stocks are Portra 400 and Ultramax 400. Those are my top two of all time. As far as other ones that I have shot more than one roll of and do continue to buy, it's just not as frequent that I use them. Kodak Gold 200 is a good option and then Ilford HP5 is a black and white film stock that is very very good. Now these are going to obviously range in price. The better the film stock, the more it's going to cost you. When I'm shooting something that I want to look nicer, things that are maybe more official shoots that I'm shooting or trips that I'm taking, I will shoot my Portra 400. It is tried and true. I've pretty much not really had any fails on Portra 400, so I love that film stock. But if it's things that are more casual, kind of like hanging out with friends or things at home, I'll typically go for an Ultramax because it is cheaper and I like the look of Ultramax for those type of memories. So you'll find what you like. If I were just starting out, I would probably start with a few rolls of Portra 400 and then one roll of a few different ones that you wanna try and you can figure out what you like best. As far as places that I purchase film stock from, so you always have to look around because the price of film is always changing. It is insanely high right now and everything is on back order. So it definitely depends on where you're looking and like I said you need to shop around for one the best deals but also two if you need it as soon as possible different places may get different shipments at different times as far as ones that I typically look at Amazon tends to be a good one for Ultramax pretty much not anything else Moment is one of my favorites for any film stocks and then also they sell one-offs for decent prices that I will use to kind of try and explore b &H Photo and then Adorama are two that remind me of a lot of each other but they typically also carry a ton of the popular film stocks as well. Definitely look around, the prices do vary a little bit surprisingly from each of them. So the next step in your process is getting your film developed and scanned. So essentially what that means is when your film comes out of your camera it's still in your canister and you need someone unless you really want to do it yourself but I would not recommend this for a beginner um, you need someone else that you can send your film to or drop your film off at to develop the film 
and then also to turn your negatives or whatever comes out of the canister into images that you're going to use some way or another so traditionally this used to be prints a lot of four by six prints and now it's very popular to get them back in digital scans which is the option that i personally choose to go for because i post all my images online and i don't really feel the need to have them in physical copies so there are a ton of different options in terms of developing and scanning your film where to to bring it to, where to send it to, but I have 100% noticed a difference in some of these options. So I believe last time I checked, you could still give your film to CVS, maybe Walgreens, maybe Walmart, but from what I've heard, and I may be wrong on this, you don't get your negatives back, it's a longer turnaround time, and it's just, it's, they don't have the appreciation for your film as other places may have and i'll get into that so those are options and they're definitely good options for disposables as well but like i said might not always get the care and feeding that you want for your film and if you're anything like me shooting film your film is very very special to you so it's important to choose a place that is going to treat your film well so that gets into a lot of these newer film labs that are popping up all around the country and one of the big things in terms of these film labs is a lot of them accept mail-in orders so this pretty much really opens up your possibilities across the entire nation and i know some of them even get international orders as well so it's tons and tons of options ones that i've heard of um, the dark room is a very very popular one they do a lot of film and a lot of different types of film me personally, I only send my film to Indie Film Lab. I have mentioned them in previous videos before, but they do such an incredible job of just taking care of your film. My scans always come out beautifully. I've seen Portra 400 scans come out not good. And I don't know who scanned and developed those, those rolls, but I've seen people shoot them. And they come to me and they send me their film and they're like, I shot this on Portra 400 and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this does not look like Portra 400 at all. So I don't know if it's the film stock. I don't know if it was expired film. If we've troubleshooted it all. And the only thing that I can think of is the film lab because developing and scanning it makes such a big difference in how it's done in terms of how your images come out at the very end. So I highly, highly recommend Indie Film Lab. Their prices are very, very good as well. And they just, they have pretty good turnaround times. They do such a good job caring for your film. They send your negatives back, of course, for a cost. You have to pay for shipping. And overall, it's just a really great experience with them. And then of course, is the last step. And that is once you get your negatives back, how you're gonna store them or what you're gonna do with them. Some people choose to dispose of their negatives and honestly, I have not used my negatives at all. So that totally could be a good option, but I am the type of person that's like, uh, I need to have everything just in case. So I have also heard of many people re-scanning their negatives once they've been developed sometime in the future. In the past, the technology is not as good as it is now. So even now, people are rescanning their old negatives from decades ago, which is so cool to think about. But it is something that you can definitely store and keep if that's something you want to potentially do in the future. Um, I also keep mine just in case I want to practice scanning in the future without having to develop my own film. So there's just a variety of different reasons why you may want to keep your negatives. And there's a ton of different ways you can store them. I personally have a binder and plastic sheets that I keep them in and then I'll cut my negatives when they go back from the lab and store them in there. And I think it's just also just a nice cool thing to have is just a binder of all your negatives. So that is kind of my film 101 video and there's so many questions about film that I could answer that I would never have time to cover in an entire video so be sure to leave all of your questions down below if you want to know about my experience shooting film my tips and tricks feel free to also check out some of my older videos as well I've talked a ton about film and different film stocks and different cameras and if you enjoy this video be sure to give it a thumbs up comment and subscribe and I appreciate you all watching till the end and I'll see you in my next video bye